Hey, thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, we're going to continue our series on the Boston Philly Marbles of the 90s. And tonight they have George Anastasia and David Schweizweiser are on tonight. And uh, you know who they are. They're uh, boat reporters from Philadelphia. And uh, they're going to fill us in a little more uh, on the Philly Marbles of the 90s. And present day, we'll talk about Joey and the crew down there. Also a dear friend of mine, he was a main guy in my crew, uh, Bobby Gentile. Passed away last week. Um, you might have seen him on the news. Uh, Bobby uh, was involved with that. Uh, they claim he was involved with that guy in a rod heist. So we're also going to be talking a little about Bobby tonight. Uh, he was a dear friend of mine. And uh, he was a main guy on my crew. And uh, I'll tell you, I just right now it's uh, a little hot for me. I really love the guy. Haven't seen him in over 20 years, but I did get a few messages from him since we started the show. And one of them was, uh, Bobby, you get fat. So that's why I went on a diet. So, uh, yeah, we should have a great show tonight. So stay tuned. We're going to be right back. Thank you. George and Dave, I want to thank you for coming on the show tonight. We got so many things to talk about to catch up on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a while. Yeah, it has. It's been a while. George, how you been? Good to be here, buddy. Doing well, thank you. Oh, that's good. Thank you, brother, for coming. You know, I'm really happy to be here tonight. You know, I, I was doing a series on the Boston Philly Wars of the 90s, and I really wanted to get into that with you guys, but we know that uh, Bobby Gentile, um, passed away last week. Right. And you know, Bobby was a main guy in my crew, you know, in the Boston faction of the Bruno Scafo family. And uh, Bobby, to me, was like a, a mentor, like a consigliere up there in Boston. And uh, you know, I, I, I feel terrible. Um, he's watched the show, believe it or not. And he had a few friends reach out to me to say hi, you know, when I started the podcast. And uh, the last message he said, he said, hey, Bobby, you're getting fat. You better lose some weight. And uh, that was the last uh, message I got from him. You know, but I'll tell you, he was really important in my crew. He was a good old man, dangerous old man, you know. And uh, I just thought that we should touch on that tonight because this is all about Philadelphia and you got two Philly guys and everybody know what great reporters you are and experts on the Philly mob. So I just wanted to bring up Bobby's name. Did, did you hear anything about Bobby? Have you heard anything, David? Or George? Well, uh, the only thing I've heard that is kind of different than everybody else's reporting, um, Bob Ward, who's on Boston 25, yeah. uh, did, his, did his story the day it got out that, uh, that Bobby had passed away. And he spoke with uh, Bobby's lawyer mm -hmm. in, a, in a phone interview, which he put on TV. And the new element that he kind of broke here is that there might be something in Bobby's will about the Gardner Art Museum heist. Wow. Um, another lawyer in Ryan McGuigan's firm drafted the will for him, and he hadn't seen it in a long time. But he seemed to be indicating that there might be some information in the will about the heist. Now, maybe it's Bobby trying to clear his name, uh, which is what he said all along, that he had no involvement, that he's not involved, he doesn't know where the paintings are, um, that kind of thing. It also was interesting, the attorney said in the same interview that from everything he heard from Bobby Gentile and everyone else, the FBI, the museum, and everything else, he had sort of kind of drawn his own conclusions. Um, and kind of acted like he could shed some light on maybe who some of the players were or what actually transpired through the years. So Bob Ward did some good reporting on this. He's a really good reporter. You know Bob, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Um, but that was the only stuff outside the fact that he passed that I saw that was original uh, last week. Well, I got to tell you, though, when Bobby Garanti came to me about the artwork, I, I told the story before on the show, um, 
and he told me he was buried under a slab of Florida in a house down there. You know, Bobby Gentile was in my company all the time. Bobby used to, uh, actually, we called him the cook. He used to cook for us. But uh, Bobby used to be out there all the time behind us. If we went up to a meeting, he'd always be the back guy in the car. He was always our backup guy. Uh, always uh, watched our safe houses. You know, he did a lot for us, Bobby. Serious guy in his day. You know, he was older. I didn't really want him on the front lines with us. So he used to stay in the back, you know, and uh, really important in the crew. He never one time, never one time mentioned that artwork to me. Never brought it up, you know, all these stories that we heard. You know, uh, Bobby Garanti never told me he had any involvement in it. And uh, what I heard is was Bobby Donati and Bobby Garanti actually did the robbery. But again, we don't know that for sure, you know, but uh, it's just tonight, uh, Dave, George, I just wanted to talk about Bobby and just Say a little something about him. Yeah, I mean, it, his name down here only comes in the context of that that heist. Right. And and I mean, I mean, we, you know, we've talked about this round and round several times. There's a five million dollar reward sitting on the table. If somebody knew something, they would have come forward if they knew where the artwork was. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, I talked to some people who who work in that field about stolen art. If they had buyers already lined up, they don't give a damn about the five million because they've already made the score. That's right. It'd be too late the tragic thing is if somebody buried it and that, that guy who buried it's not around anymore and his artwork is just going to rot in in a, in a, in a grave somewhere. But, you know, yeah. it's it's one of the great mysteries. What are we, 30 years now? Yeah, 31. Yeah. 31. Yeah, 31 years. And, uh, you know, the story of it coming through Philadelphia adds a little bit of intrigue to, from our perspective, but in a, nobody's ever nailed that down. It's, it's just one of the many rumors floating around about that. Yeah. Well, I, I just don't believe the rumors, to be honest with you. You know, yeah. um, Bobby Gentile would have been the guy when I went away and Joey went away to actually bring the paintings down there. If anybody was going to do it, you know, but, I, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess Bobby Garanti's wife, we used to call her auntie, told the feds that Bobby Gentile got a few pieces of artwork, that she saw her husband give Bobby Gentile this artwork. He denies it. He said he saw her with the little stamp, the painting. You know, it's just stories yeah. back and forth. That's and, all and it is. The, the word down here was never that he had all of them. Yeah. Uh, or that all of them passed through Philadelphia. The word down here was two or three paintings right. yeah. passed through here, possibly through an art dealer who lived in Rittenhouse Square, not an art dealer in Rittenhouse Square. He lived there but worked in New York. Right. And there's another figure whose name that gets mentioned from back in the Scarpo era. Uh, along with that guy. Uh, I'm pretty sure the FBI's kind of checked that out. The other interesting thing I kind of heard last week is that there seems to be some folks that believe that because now uh, Bobby's no longer with us, that folks start talking. Right. Um, if, if he was one of the guys, they can't hurt him. Yeah. Um, kind of thing. But listen, maybe he uses his will here to clear his name. Maybe he uses his will here to, you know, give at least some direction to the investigation again. Not that they don't have any now, but there's none that we've heard of. And if he gives direction and it leads to something, uh, actually the reward's ten million. Yeah. And maybe in his will he says who he wants to leave the money to. Mm -hmm. If in fact he gets credit for it. So I mean, I could see that as a possibility. It's we'll possible. see if the lawyer ever reveals what was in the will. I don't know. It's possible. When you say two or three pieces went through Philly, that is possible. You know, Bobby uh, Garanti might have gave him a few pieces. Maybe Auntie was right. I don't know, you know. But yeah. uh, we're just going to have to see. We're going to have to, you know, see if anything comes out of that well and see where we go from there. But is it, it is interesting because he was a May guy in the Philly family, you know, and he's part of this whole thing. Uh, a lot of people don't understand um, how that all worked with me and how I became a cop with the Philly family, Boston, Boston. and But the separate factions, I was the Boston faction of the Bruno Scafo family. And when they indicted me and Joey, and you just remember that, when that happened in 99, George, when Joey and I got indicted, they gave us two separate indictments. Joey's faction in Philly and my faction in Boston. So they get us both with that leadership. 
But Bobby, before you, there never was a fully fact in Boston. I mean, you were it. No, that was it. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole way it came about. So it's not like this is, a, you know, there's always been a Philly faction in Newark, Newark, yeah. New Jersey. But in terms of Boston, that, that was the one time and the only time, I think, that Philadelphia had a, a, a flag in the ground up there. Yeah, yeah, I did that. And Bob Gen Bobby Gentile didn't get indicted with you guys, correct? No, he didn't. Right. right? Yeah. Was he the only one, the only one in the Philly faction still out there in Boston after you guys got taken down? No, no, I, I made a lot of guys. My cousins were out okay. there. When we actually hooked up with Ron Previty, when he came to me at Joe's party, and George knows a lot of this story. When he came to me at Joe McGinn, she, she, I'm sorry, Joe McGinn's party. Look, look at George. He's like the Bible. Yeah, and, and he approached me about the drugs. You know, uh, I knew something was wrong at that point. I was already sitting up there with that Fed, but he was talking about different things, and I told him there's you know a. Probably, and, and people, especially people up where you are, don't may not know the whole backstory. There's a whole question. I mean, I'm with, I love Ronnie. Ronnie was a good friend. I know. I, I know he was. I know. But so a lot of people say, how did he? How was he able to get close to Raph Natale and Joey Molino? Ronnie Previty was a soldier with John Stamper yep. in that war. Yep. Stamper and about 26 guys get indicted. Ronnie doesn't get indicted. I know. What does that tell? You? Yet, yep. yet Ronnie is able to switch sides and and insinuate himself into the Merlino and, and the Tally faction. What's that about? And I, when I asked Ronnie about it, he said, "Well, it was simple. Every time I saw those guys, I bought an envelope, and as long as I was bringing the money, they didn't care." I mean, it, it, it's it's very bizarre to me that the, the way that thing played out. But it's indicative of what was going on down here in Philadelphia that money was all that mattered. So Ronnie Ronnie yep. Perry's is with Stamper. Stamper's trying to kill Joey in the tally. Stamper gets indicted. So does twenty six of his guys. Mm -hmm. Ronnie doesn't get indicted. And within two months, we're seeing Ronnie hanging around with Italy. What the hell was that? Uh, the whole hey, George, you, yeah. George, you remember this video when John Stamper came to the grand jury in oh, yeah. New Jersey. Absolutely. The guy on his right hand walking in from the parking lot. Ronnie Previn. All that media is Ronnie Previn. Yep. So <laughs> you want to talk about how close the guy is. He's going to a, a state grand jury in my building. I was working for the attorney general at the time. Yeah. And he's the guy on his right hand. Walking in from the parking lot, riding up the escalator to the grand jury. That shows how close he was to Stanford. Ronnie Previn and Freddie Aldridge used to drive John Stanford to work every morning from South Jersey to South Philly. Yeah. And Freddie was driving a car today in the ambush. But Freddie Aldridge was Ronnie's guy. Ronnie and Freddie were like this. And they, Ronnie ended up playing everybody. And, and I'm, I'm saying this that I love the guy. I, you know, he's passed now. He died. He yeah. Died. No, I know. Ronnie was able to play everybody. And when he, when he approached you, it was all part of that pattern, you know? I mean, you, you walked into a hornet's nest down here. I don't think you realized it. No, I know. I, it ended up to be yeah. that. I mean, I wasn't going to do any business with Ronnie. Nothing. When he approached me with the drugs, I was palling them off. Right away, Sean Viteri was at that party with me. And I grabbed Sean. I said, they just asked for drugs. Why are they coming to Boston? They're right next to New York and New Jersey. They're going to come up there and get drugs from us. You know, they want coke. So right away, the flags went up. Yeah. So at that time, uh, Irish Mike, we called him, the federal agent. I put him <laughs> my cousin Paul. Yeah. But I put him on Paul. Yeah. I, I put him on Paulie because it was just supposed to be for protection because he was Ronnie's guy. Once the drugs came in, I pulled everybody back. And I went front on that. That's why I was in that pinch. I went front on it. And Bob, Bob I got to tell you. We have enough drugs in Philadelphia without your drugs. I know that. I mean, Kensington is the number one drug area in the country. People come from the West Coast to buy drugs in Kensington. So we didn't need your drugs. Yeah. You, I can I could see why that red flag went up. Oh, of course. When that happened. Oh, what am I, a moron? I've been you know, on the street all my life. And I told Sean, pull everybody back. I don't want no one dealing with this guy. Here's the problem, George. I want you to understand, and Dave. If I said, no, I'm not doing it, if I did anything to Ronnie, I would have had to go up against Joey. You just know that. You know, I was under Joey. I was his capo, and I'm supposed to be following orders. What I tried to do is get away from it, pal him off, tell him I couldn't help him, 
But, you know, he pressured me. The other guy pressured me yeah. to help him. <laughs> and that's how he jammed me up. That's how and he Joey got up. indicted for the drugs down here as part of the big Rico against him and those other guys. Yeah. And he, and he beat that part of the case. He did. Yeah, he, Joey got caught up in that, same as you did, but he beat it down here. Yeah, yeah I, I, they, he got acquitted. And I'm up there, but they want to throw the books at me 20 years. <laughs> you know? It was ridiculous what happened. It was ridiculous. Hey, George, you know, the, the one time I was fortunate enough to talk to Ronnie after it already came out that he was the cooperator and he was kind of living off the grid a little bit, he uh, chuckled that those guys actually thought they could get over on him when he was actually getting over on them. He said... They, they, they thought they were smarter than him. And at the, at the end of the day, look who was smart. You know? To this day, they're still saying that. To this yeah. day, they're still saying, oh, we always knew, we always knew. And I'm saying to myself, we always knew, what are you dealing with? I had I had lunch with the wives of a couple guys who were convicted with Joey in that case. And this is when, you know, everybody referred to Ryan Previty as the frat rat, and he's a rat, he's this, he's that. Yeah. And the two wives over lunch said to me, he's out on the street living his life. Our husbands are in jail. Who's smarter? Yeah. You know, that, that, Ronnie. That's what it comes down to. I always find that women cut right through the nonsense and they get to the heart of it. And their, their bottom line was, our husbands are going away for 10, 12 years. He's out on the street. Who won? You call yeah. him what you want to call him. Who won the game there? No, that's Ronnie the won the game. Ronnie should have never been there. Ronnie should. When I first met Ronnie, I was at Joey's uncle's house. He had a pool. There was a pool party. I don't remember where it was. Right. And Ronnie was trying to push shrimp on me. I don't even know this guy. The guy, I got to, uh, <laughs> what is what they're trying to do? Get swag and get everything in with me. You know what they were doing, George. You know the whole case. They tried to get me to get everything. And uh, I wasn't even interested in it. I did not like him. I just got a bad feeling from that guy. You know? Well, at least, Bob, they, they didn't ask you for baby milk or insulin or anything Remember like that. They got yeah. a few truckloads of that here. They had here. so many different swag in Bikes, right, right, George? A whole truckload of bicycles? Right. Truck, truck, truckload of baby formula that they couldn't move. They had to abandon it on New Jersey Turnpike. They had bicycles. They had sweatsuits. They had fans. You're right. I mean, you, you pick up. See, Bobby, I understand. You were in a funny position because you're beholden to the guys down in Philly. You yes. You've got to report to those guys. They're introducing this guy to you. And your antenna's up and you're saying something's wrong here, but what can you do about that? You're Dude, in a tough spot. I was in a bad spot. Yeah. You know, I you always... Don't forget the yellow Lamborghini they couldn't get rid of either. The yellow Lamborghini? Well, yeah, you know what happened? Cleveland, yeah, Cleveland, Ohio. Irish Mike comes up with uh, fur coats. Yeah. Listen to this kid. Hang on, Yeah. Well, Pauly, well, Pauly Tanzo said, Pauly Tanzo was a main guy in the Philly crew. He's got, sitting on the side of the leather Donna Karen New York one, the expensive one. Yeah, so what I did is I took the first and I gave up. My wife took one, I gave a few away. And I had no intentions of giving them back, I'm not going to lie to you. But uh, he called me, he was all nervous, like, please take them back. So I take, I take them back with a few shots. Nobody wears fur coats anymore. Yeah. It wasn't a big thing to move. I had a big book with me, with me, Paul. He comes over now. He says, Bobby, nobody wants this shit. So I bring it back. I'm doing this. I'm trying to help Ronnie and this guy, Mike, in the beginning. This is before the drugs came in the picture. Right. My guy, Tommy Caruso, main guy in the family. Tommy passed away now. He tells this Irish Mike, get that camp stuff. What do you call those cameras? You used to have the cartridge. Come on, what do you Polaroids. Polaroids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I got a guy with a store. Get me cases of it. I'll move it. We got the cases. They got me carrying freaking boxes. Now, the guy offers us so much for it. I call this kid. This is petty bullshit. I'm making 20, 30, 40,000 a week. And I'm dealing with this petty bullshit to try to help these guys. I end up taking the film back. And I told him, it's on a tape, George. I said, I'm running five cities over here. Stop with this bullshit. Remember? It was on the tapes. You know, and that that I had to end that, and then they were pressuring me with the coke, pressuring me. What was they gonna do? Did I have to worry if I go to Philly? I'm I'm not gonna come out of the cellar or a meeting. You don't know what's gonna happen. Bobby's not listening. He don't give a shit no more. You gotta remember, I was separate from them, George. I had my own faction up in Boston. No, no. I mean, and that's you were in a tough spot in that situation because Ronnie is their guy. 
Ronnie's coming up to do business. What are you going to say? I'm not going to do business with you? Yeah. So you, you got a tough situation there. Yeah. I mean, Ronnie's doing the same stuff down here, though. Remember, he's got the swag coming off of Delaware Avenue from the ports. Yeah. He's got Rolex watches. Remember yep. that day? Joey oh, had yeah. More Rolex watches. Get me they one. love Rolex watches. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, it was a classic FBI sting. I mean, it was set up. I got a watch, too. I got a Blue Samaritan from him. The fact that he blew some out and I fought I fought them, I wanted it back. <laughs> Joey Joey still has his, by the way. Does he really? Check his wrist. Yeah. yeah, he must have hit it. He was smarter than us. He must have hit it. They yeah. came right on my house and grabbed it. Where's the watch they said? They know what to look for, yeah. That's it. <laughs> too funny. I'll tell you though. But you wanna know something? It was crazy up in Boston too. But uh, we were a little more careful up here. Yeah. A little more hey, careful than what's going can on. You tell us can you tell us the size of the Philly Boston crew? Not naming names or anything, but how many guys were? There? Yeah, how many guys? I, I, I don't think I ever saw a number put on it. Your name came up. Sean Vitari's name came up. A couple other guys. I'm not asking you name names, but how big of a crew was it to begin with? Well, you have to remember when we talk about this. So I'll let you understand. Yeah. Um, I had intentions. You both know of breaking off from Philly after two years. That's the deal that I made with Joey. I was going to be a cop in the Philly in the Philly mall for two years, and then I was going to break off and have my own family. And I didn't give a shit if New York liked it or not, because we already had the power up in Boston. And Philly would have been a good ally for me. That's why we all hooked up. Um, we made, there was eight May guys up in Boston, including myself, but I had another dozen that I was going to make. But now, you know, I made all the bad guys. Tommy, Paulie, my cousins, they're, they're all bad kids, you know. But um, now I was ready to start bringing money guys in. You know, I had some big bookmakers that had crews with them. I was going to start bringing them in. I, Is Bobby Gentile in that group that we're talking about? I made Bobby. He was in the first round. Bobby That's Gentile was a made guy. Yeah. When I broke off, I was going to make Bobby Gentile like my consigliere. More or less. He was going to be a captain. He had a few guys in, in uh, Connecticut he wanted to straighten you know, out. We were going to straighten a crew out in Connecticut. You yeah. know, Bobby would have been a captain, but really more like my consigliere, Bobby Gentile. Was he really a good cook? That's my question. They called him the cook. He must have been pretty good, right? He was a great cook. Everything was spicy and hot, but let me tell you, it was delicious. I got to give him credit. Yeah. Paulie, did you eat? And hot, huh? Yeah, okay. Paulie, did you eat uh, oh, the cooked food? Yeah, well, you were up at the safe houses. Yeah, we had three safe houses. We, we go yeah, Bob, every yeah. Night. Bobby had dishes at every at every safe house he was cooking. Oh, you kept him busy, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. God bless We'd him. Be driving around all night long, hey, go back and I, dinner with I got ready. a word of advice for you guys: open a restaurant for crying out loud. <laughs> I know that would have been a good thing. <laughs> Call it the cook. Yeah, in his, in his memory. I know. Imagine that. I, I I feel so bad, Dave. He was such a great guy. You know, yeah. a lot of guys will look at him the way he dressed, and older guy, you know, little shit got. For me, I didn't like the way he dressed, but let me tell you, Sharp, he had wisdom. I sit there, we planned out a lot of things together, you know, really smart guy. He was always fun to be around. Yeah, yeah, like Paulie said, a real good guy to be around. He's a funny bastard, you know. And, uh, I, oh, I got to tell you what happened now. I bring Bobby Gentile. Up at the Mike's office, Irish Mike, we call him, right, George? I bring him up the office. That's the day they give me the Rolex. I have a Movado on, and I gave it to the cook. Right there, we're sitting in there. I say, hey, Bob, you take this one, because I love them, you know? You take this Movado. He calls me that night because they said they got the furs out of Connecticut, which was a lie. Now, Bobby's in Connecticut. You know, he's all tuned in down there. So he calls me that night. He says, F that guy, bring the watch back. Don't take the furs, he told me. Because this guy's full of shit. I don't like the way the office looked. No, by right, I should have been listening. But I explained to Bobby, we're in a jam here with this guy, with Joey. I wasn't at a point, and I love Joey, and I, don't want, I would never disrespect him, and not even on TV today. But I wasn't at a point that I could tell Joey to screw. You know, that wasn't going to happen. And I believe in Lucas and Ostro. And he was my boss. So I respected Joey like that. Uh, was Joey too loose then? Yeah. He was riding by the seat of his pants, George. We know that. You know that, Dave. You know? 
another another Ronnie Prudy said, you know, it's good to be smart, but it's even better to be lucky. And and Joe has always been lucky. Yeah, God and bless him. This is one example. We're talking about this drug case. You had to go deal with it in Boston. He had to deal with it in Philly as part of a much bigger Rico when he beat that case. Yeah. Recently, he's jammed up in Florida in a compound cream scam, multi-million dollar scam. And the feds in New York want him in New York, so they take him out of Tampa, where the case is, and they put him in New York. And he beats the case in New York. The guys in Tampa got hammered. I mean, Joe has been able to skate away from stuff. Um, for every fortuitously. I mean, and, and luck is important in the business, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a little strange, you know, but hey, you know, what are you going to do? You know, today... Part of, part of his charisma, part of his image. That That's what it is. I mean, right yeah, now, Joey's... 19 lives, not 9 lives, 19 lives. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, Joey is the face of organized crime today. He's the man. I've heard, people, I've heard people say nationwide. He's yeah, nice. no, he's American. A, he, that's it. He's American La Cosa Nostra. Yeah. It's Joey Molino. That's two people who were down here, man. He was targeted several times. Bombs, bullets, and, and always managed to skate away. Yeah. And one time he got wounded, right, Dave? I mean, yeah. Think about it. John Veazey. Yeah, John Veazey shot him. Yeah. You know? Oh. Yeah, he's an interesting captain. And, 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 you know, Joey was just here recently for a couple weeks. He's living down in Florida. I think if he's smart, he'll stay in Florida. He comes up here and everybody's looking at him. He's better yeah. than me. Well, you know, uh, two weeks at yeah. two weeks at Jersey Shore, and then he goes away for a week. The reporting we did was that he was in Vegas for a little bit, and then he's back in Philadelphia. He's at a couple of ball games, Phillies games. He's at a very popular sports bar in South Philly after an Eagles big win and opening the opening weekend. Mm -hmm. He's got people all around him. He's smoking at the bar. He can care less if he can't smoke in a bar in Philadelphia. He's smoking away. <laughs> um, he's traveling all over the place. We heard about a trip to New York. Um, he stayed a couple of extra days. The following week, he shows up at the clubhouse at 9th and Christian. Kind of a surprise to everybody. I thought Joey had been very, very smart for the last two years on house arrest and then on supervised release. Yeah, but I I think this traveling back up here thing. I don't know about that. I think that's kind of, you know, making the target on your back even bigger. And when you go to a clubhouse, and listen, you can use the argument, George. You and I've heard it a hundred times. They're friends. They grew up together. He hasn't been really free to do anything for the past five years between being on trial, being in prison, and being on supervised release. And now all of a sudden, he can go see people. So that's probably what he's doing. Yeah. But it does it does put a question mark at the end of the sentence there. What why is he here? Well, you know, my point of view on the whole thing, yeah. yeah, I don't care what anybody, you know, we all know and I believe, you know, Joey's always gonna be the boss. If he's active, if if he isn't active, these guys are always gonna look up to Joey, you know, and uh all right, so Lance is out there, I know that. Steve Mazzone's out there, Georgie's out there. These guys are, you know, they can run the family with no problem. Everybody came up together, and you know, I was around them in the 90s. I seen how, how their relationships were and what they formed. But uh, I don't know Joey's status right now, being semi-retired or whatever he's doing. But uh, Joey's always gonna have a foot in Philadelphia, David. If you got my meat, he's always going to have his foot in there. You know, maybe he has to financially. I mean, we don't know the reasons. You know, but like I said, anybody talks about Joey, Joey's the guy. Joey's the man. Joey's the boss. Am I right, George? I mean, Dave and I have talked about this. If you look at Joey's lifestyle. Yeah. What's his source of income? I don't see any source of income, but he's living very well. So he's got to, you know, the, the supposition is... There's something coming to him from from Philly to, to areas of Florida. We don't know that. Yeah. But you look at it, you say, well, you know, how's this guy live the way he lives? Mm -hmm. He's a very good person. He lives very well. You know, very yeah. well. You know, God bless him, and you know, I'm happy for him. But you know, I just, you know, Joey's. It's always going to be. Uh, I, I'm sorry to say this, but it's always going to re be a revolving door for Joey, if he stays around him. If he goes down to Florida. Keeps himself busy with something else. He'll be fine. He'll be yeah, fine. Yeah, that's why I thought he was doing the smart thing, to be honest with you. I really, the last few years. I, I, he, George, you know as well as I do, 
He wasn't talking to anybody. Yeah. He wasn't putting himself on the map down there. In fact, he was doing the opposite. He was trying to stay off the map. Which was a smart move, given what happened up there. I mean, we, you know, they had the making ceremony. Everybody gets recorded. They're there. Yeah. They're always not there. And yeah, that was lucky for him, you know. Yeah. yeah. But uh, hey, Bob. Yeah. Bob, let's say can we we talk to you about making ceremonies? Not a direct question about it, but after the fact, when you find out an induction ceremony that you were at, not meaning you, but you know the group. Yeah. How is it, what what being talked about after that happens? How did that happen? Who? How did that guy get in there? The does it, does blame get put around about who brought the guy to the meeting, who who who, yeah, who sponsored the guy? You know, what I'm I mean, what's what's the internal thinking? I guess. Well, the internal when, thinking you, when you find out an induction ceremony is, is caught on tape and everybody's on tape. Let's, everybody. Let's go back. Except Joe. Twenty thirty years ago. Yeah, that's what I mean from your experience. If I proposed a guy, and I brought him into the meeting, and that guy was wearing a wire. Me and that guy are in a lot of trouble. Lagavish? Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. You know, but I mean, you know, David and I followed this stuff for a long time. The best I can determine, Bobby, there's only been four making ceremonies that were ever recorded. The first one was up near you, at Medford. In Medford, in 89. Yep. Mm -hmm. Then there was one recently in Canada. I think it was the, the Bananos had a crew in Canada. Yep, they did. The other two were Philadelphia. So two different times, a Philly guy wore a body wire to his own making ceremony. What the hell does that say? About, it's sad. About, you know, what, what are you talking about? It's sad. George first of all recorded his own making ceremony, and, mm -hmm. and, and he was cooperating. And then this other guy, now Persiano, we believe, was wearing a wire to his making ceremony. So four making ceremonies in total, two of them Philadelphia. What, what does that say about the Philly guys? I don't know. It says something. It's just too loose. It's too loose. Now, yeah. I got made in Philadelphia. You guys know that. The rest of my guys got made in Boston. And all the guys that I made up here were all close to me. And, but still what we did, we'd walk around uptown, go in a random hotel, and have the ceremony. We did this twice. We're just a bunch of guys hanging around, have a drink, and then we go duck in a hotel room and have our ceremony. <clears throat> Take the phones out, the beepers at the time, they went in the bathroom, the door got shut, nobody had electronics on them, and we did the ceremony. We did it twice. And Bob, did the guys, nobody did even the guys knows. that were getting made, did they know they were getting made that day, or just randomly walk them around and say, hey, we're going in here? Like, did they have advance notice they were getting made when you were on that day? Probably not, right? I not really. You, you want to keep it as secret as possible, right? Yeah, not really. I just say, hey, listen, we're all meeting. Everybody got to be here at a certain time. And that was it. And then I took them. You know? And if I was still in the life, I'll tell you what I would do. If I was the boss of the family, I'd grab the guy that proposed the guy and maybe another captain. Grab, if we're going to make one or two guys, just four or five of us, sneak off the hotel room like I did with my guys, make them, do the ceremony. Then afterwards, the next day, I start introducing them to everybody. And that's how I would do it. Because you're not going to get away with it no more. You can't trust anybody. You know, the biggest fear of getting out of prison and coming home is getting involved in another indictment. You know? Any guys that are around, and I hate to say it because I love Lance and Stevie and, and George and these guys, but they're walking indictments, Bo. I mean, it's just, it's going to happen. They're under surveillance constantly. How do you get away from that? And to your point, I mean, they have this making ceremony in, in somebody's house in South Philly. They yep. go all out to arrest them. The whole crew, with, the, with 10, 12 guys, they go to a restaurant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and you know, the guy with the wire is still there. He's picking up all kind of conversation. See, that's the problem. The, the, the yeah, main and that's thing. The conversation, <coughs> that's the conversation that has Stevie Mazzone in trouble. Yeah. The post-ceremony conversation. I know. What I don't off, get is. And what he talked about. What I don't get is the actual ceremony. There's some big names in there. Big names. You talked about Lance. Yeah. A according to Jerry Capisi's reporting out of New York, Mike Lancelotti is the guy inducting these guys. He's conducting the ceremony, yeah. 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 And Joe Legambi, from what I know, as everybody gets introduced, he's given the rank of yeah. each guy in the room. Yeah. Here's who they are. You know, and, and I mean, 
Yeah. That's the top two guys. Yeah, I that mean, is. Right there. That is. In, on the street at yeah. that time. Yeah. Yeah. That's, see, that's, that's the problem. And another thing, in these meetings, you can't talk about business. You can't get up and make speeches, talk about criminal activity. Go in there, do it, and get out of there. There's no law, you judge, you know this, there's no law in this country becoming a made guy, they can't arrest you for that. They can't do that. Then they'll have to go to the Sons of Italy Club, the Veterans Club, and everywhere else. Am I right or wrong? Knights of Columbus. Knights of Columbus. <laughs> yeah. Anywhere they take it all, they'll have to. Knights of Columbus, I can say that. Yeah. <laughs> Anywhere you take it all, you'd have to go. Pick them all up. To so, quote them, it's not a crime to belong to an organization. Correct, yeah. George? How many times have you heard that? Yeah. It, so, uh, in the last trial, it's not a, just because you belong isn't a crime. No. It isn't a crime until a crime's committed. So if I get made in a meeting, and we're not talking about murder, extortion, drugs, hey, what are they going to do? Yeah. No one's thinking, folks. You know, it's not a platform to get up. It's not the old days. Because in the old days, you'd have a big dinner. Everybody was there. They would get up and talk. They'd get up and do the ceremonies in Italian and English. Forget it now. See, at Tony Soprano, there's an episode they made Christopher. They went, yeah. half a dozen guys went in the cellar, done, farooed, and they're out. That's what you got to do today. You know? Well, I mean, the bottom line here is this, the secret society is not so secret anymore. No. Sort of no. Yeah. Come on, the government knows all talk, the we ceremonies. We were talking about Joey. We were talking about Joey. You know, he wasn't at that ceremony. He's not on tape at that ceremony. But a couple of guys, while the ceremony's ending, one guy says to the other guy, how come that guy's not here? And you know that guy he's talking about. Yeah. And he, one of the guys says, because he's smart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's always better to get made by the boss. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Joey would have been the light of the room if he came in. Yeah. It, pr it, it pricked everybody's fingers. You know, that's how it works. But Lance is hey, a Bob, great guy. Yeah. Bob, let me ask about Lance. What, yeah. what were your impressions of him? Most most people, including people that Joey George, at the New York trial, he talked about this, the big Christmas party. Lance gets introduced by Joey as the acting street boss yeah, yeah. In, Philadelphia, in Philadelphia. And a couple of guys in the room were unnerved because the whole night he never spoke. Yeah. And they were, they were going to Joey and saying, how come this guy doesn't talk? He doesn't say anything to anybody. What, can you tell us what, what your impressions were of him? Well, first of all, I, I loved him. He was quiet. He was a quiet guy. He was. Uh, you know, I was over the house, met his girl, everybody in South Philly, and he opened up a little to me, but I'd be around him constantly and not have a conversation with him, and I just expected that from him, but he did, Lance did go out of the way a lot and talk with me, he did, compared maybe to some other people. I really liked him and I respected him, you know, and uh, he's a quiet guy, he's like an old timer, boy. He's the guy that sits in the car and listens to everybody and takes it all in. And I respect that about Lance. And I still respect Lance till today. And Lance is a very, very dangerous guy. We all know that. So, and he's walked, he's walked away from a lot of stuff. He's yeah. never been seriously convicted. Yeah. yeah, well, he keeps his mouth shut. He's not fl yeah. you know, flashy like these other guys, you know, not flamboyant at all. Like these other guys, like me and Joey were. And I admit that, you know. We wanted to be movie stars. Not gonna lie about that. I was doing it myself. My guys used to tell me to calm down, you know. But listen, it was a different era. But Lance well, is kind of like a throwback. In another life, you would have been Dean Martin. I think you would have been much happier. You know, I sing like him, Judge. <laughs> Don't let me stop right now. I'll break out of two like right that, now. George. That was good. That was good. So, Bob, he, he was the quiet guy you thought he was, right? Yes, absolutely. Everybody thinks he is, I should say. Yeah, he is. I'll say because that Because most him. other main guys who beat him, at least from what we know publicly in documents and tapes and stuff, were surprised at just how quiet he was. George, you and I, no. I'll give hey, up. A, I'll give what up. do you usually get from him? How you doing? That's it. Nothing else. Well, I give, I'll give you up a few little secrets of the life. Let's say uh, I get introduced to a guy in New York. Once I'm finally introduced to that guy, we're supposed to open up a conversation. 
Oh, yeah, you knew this guy, I knew that guy. It's a joyous thing. You can't get that out of Lance. It's not going to happen. See, there's a difference of um, how he carries himself and what people expect of him. And that's the problem. But thank God for him, he carries himself like that. Now, if you got like Stevie Bazon and introduced him to a guy in New York, Stevie's the type of guy he's going to open up. He's going to talk. Do you understand? Yeah. You know, Stephen knows the life. He's going to talk about it. You know, Lance, you, you're not going to get that from him. He's just not made up like that. And he's good in that position right now. I got to be honest. You know, I just, you know, listen, we're not stupid. You know, those guys don't care about me no more. But there's still something in my heart. These guys took me in. And I still care about these guys. It, it bothers me. When I hear things and I heard about Stephen with the meeting and Lance, you know, it bothers me. It really does. I can't lie to you about that, you know? But Stevie's already paying the price for that. The question is whether Lance is going to have some jeopardy down the road because he oversaw that making ceremony. Uh, that in and of itself is not a, a criminal. It's criminal not a criminal. It's not. But it just puts him in the light. It, it's a proof. Exactly. And if they That's what it is. Some other predicate acts. Right. And that tick becomes damaging. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of the guys we talked to, George has heard it. I've heard it. Now that that thing's on tape, everybody who's there, everybody who's on tape, everybody who's quoted in there, everybody whose name appears in a transcript, if they start committing crimes that can be tied to the organization, they're going to trot that tape out. Of course. And that transcript out. And they, they're going to make another indictment. Yeah. And have another trial. That's going to be the centerpiece of the trial. And then they're going to introduce these. And it could be small predicate acts, right, George? I mean, to our knowledge, they're not doing anything big that I'm aware of at this point. No, the, you know, it's happening back up here, too. They're looking for old cases now. Yeah. Because something just happened with me. I'm not going to talk about it, you know. But I got a, I got a few visits since I've been home. You know, and uh, I keep my mouth shut. I don't say nothing. You know that. But they're, they're digging right now up here. And I know they're digging really deep down there. And the fear is the past right now. Because you know the past comes up to bite you in the ass. And that's what I'm worried about with my friends down there and up here. Yeah, well, I mean, we've said this a lot. There's no statute on the murder case. There I mean, isn't. That's always going to be there. And, and that's what the feds have been working on. Down here for what ten years? They've, they've been trying to. Yeah. Get, there's four or yeah. five unsolved murders sitting out there. That they'd love to put in a RICO, and so far they haven't been able to do it. We'll see. You know, they told me. You know, there was a dozen murders up here in Boston in the '90s, and Easy Dozen, and they said uh, really none of them are solved. So yeah. I said, well, why are you coming to me? I got nothing to do with this. They laughed at me when I said that, but you know. I said, listen, guys, I'm not a rat. I'm not going to tell you nothing. I don't know nothing. And they left, you know, but this is what they do. This is what they do. They're going to keep digging till they hit something. It never goes away. It don't. And those guys know that. It never goes away. You know, and I'm, I'm, you know yeah. let's pray these guys get away with what they do, and that's it. And same thing with me, you know. I get nervous because when I did do what I did, I didn't tell them everything. And, you know, that always haunts you. But you know, so many guys passed away up here since I've been home. So I really don't got too much to worry about, George. I don't think, you know. Yeah. Hey, Bob. Yeah. What's your He's laughing. Of George, George is he laughing. Had, Who? He had a 20 year run here. What, what, what do you think of him? You met him, it sounds like, a couple times. You, I'm sure, gauged him. Who's that? Um, Uncle Joe? Joe again. Oh, yeah. what a George, great George guy he was. Says the, guy, the guy wants to make money, not headlines. Yeah. And what what was your impression of him? Well, I used to call him Uncle because it was Georgie's uncle. So I started yeah. Uncle Joe down there. I started calling him Uncle Joe. I got close with him, you know, around the family, the kids, always at the parties. I, every time I was down there, I was with him most of the time. All with Georgie, but, uh, you know, Uncle Joe was always there. And he just reminded me of my family and the guys that I grew up with. And I, I again, another guy I had a lot of respect for. But he was a hard nose. And I remember when he became underboss, because he got right on me with a few things he wanted. You know, and, uh, you know, listen, he did a lot of time. He got out. He got positioned. 
you know, and he felt he deserved certain things. Because I heard a lot of stories, guys. I know he's a talking about. But he probably was a good boss. He lasted 20 years, like you said. And uh, that's a guy, you know, if I didn't get picked up in that round, he would have been my boss. He would have been the actor boss. And that's right. a guy I would have followed. Let me say that. You know, he's from the old faction, wise guy all his life, and that's a guy I would have had no problem following. Not that I'd have a follow, problem following Lance, because I wouldn't, you know, but uh, Joe Legambi, he reminds me of the guys back home. A lot of respect for him. You know, there's really uh, nothing bad I could say about these guys. I hung around with them, I drank with them, we did some things together. Made money with some of them. I just, you know, really like these guys. You got to remember, in my position, coming down from Boston, they just opened their arms up to me. You know, everybody thinks there was some kind of big money deal made. There really wasn't. If you just want to talk about that, you know. You know that was always the rumor that you had to pay ten grand a month to get made. That's what that's what everybody was talking about down here. That you, you had to pay to get in. Yeah, they said I could pay again. That gave Joey a hundred thousand. With, with right. This is all nonsense that came in. When I came down, you have to remember something. When I did go down to Philly, they didn't even ask for that much money. But I'm moving a lot of coke. To me, 10000 was nothing. I said, you know what? I'll send out 10000 a month. You know, Once I get made and once I become a captain, I'll do that. I told them. You know? And that was no problem at all. It was, for what I was making, it was nothing. You know, but when I stopped dealing the coke, that went right down. And I'll be honest with you. Because Georgie wanted me to stop dealing for a gazy. That was one of the, you know, conditions of making me and my guys. He really didn't want us involved with the drugs. I had a big loan shark business. I had almost a million on the street, but that was my money. You know, when you get incorporated into a family, whatever I have is supposed to belong to the family. I didn't think like that. And I'll be perfectly honest with you. That was mine, and what was in Boston was mine. I just sent you a piece of it. And that's how I felt about that uh, arrangement that we made. But as soon as I stopped dealing with the cocaine, that money went in half. You know? Because I wasn't going to my pocket with my other businesses and send the money down there. Yeah. It wasn't going to happen. You know, so people could think what they want and say what they want. The 10000 is true, George. That's true. Yeah. And that, to me, was nothing. Believe me. That was nothing to send out. I wanted to send it to help them. You know? Well, I mean, if you look at the way Joey ran the organization, I mean, it was all about establishing different cash streams. Yeah, of course. And, and, yeah. And, and if he's got a branch up in Boston, there's going to be a cash stream from Boston. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but come, come back to Ronnie Prebby. Joey's agenda on Monday was to get to Tuesday. And yeah. And spend the money, and then tomorrow we'll get more money. That kind of stuff. Well, you know, look at me up in Boston. Let's say, uh, not my crew now, let's say I made 100000 for the month. What's wrong with sending 10 now? That's nothing. That's nothing. I was pulling seven, 8000 a week in just with my shy money. So what was that sending that? That was nothing, you know? But, you know, a civilian that said, oh, my God, that's a lot of money. Listen, if we're not on the street making that kind of money, why are we out there, David? <laughs> you know what I mean, Josh? <laughs> On the other hand, there, yeah. there was a capo in Newark named Joey Sedano who wasn't coming down, and he ended up getting popped. Yeah, and that's the that's the other side of that thing. It's, yeah, uh, it's expected, and you got to deliver something. Well, listen, you remember the Sedano story, Dave? Yeah, you know, let me, you know, Bob, you, that could have been you. You talked about earlier in the show. If you refuse to come down, or you refuse to come to a meeting that maybe Previty set up, yeah. and that got back to Joey. You could have been Sedano. Yeah. You Absolutely. Know, you're not doing what we're asking you to do. Absolutely. So then what? I got to pull back and I got to be at odds with my friends now over this? I didn't ever want yeah. to disrespect Joey or Georgie or these guys. They were my friends. I, I didn't want to do that. I really believe, and still till today, the Coles of Lacoste and Austria. I really believe in that. Now, you know what I did, George? I had to save my life. They were coming at me with murders from all over, we're not gonna talk about it. And I did what I did to save my life because I felt my friends in Boston and some friends in Philly threw me to the wolves. 
I think you could understand why I felt like that, you know. And uh, not no disrespect against any of them, but uh, I felt I had to do what I had to do. But the life itself, I really believed it, and I grew up in it, you know. And I was around a lot of shitheads in Boston. A lot of bad guys, a lot of shitheads. I go to Philly, I meet a bunch of nice guys that are hanging together, the tight crew. And that's something that I liked about that down there. That they let me in that circle a little, you know. Well, Dave and I have talked about this, but for a lot of the guys around Joey, Joey, Stevie, Georgie, it was cause and Austin, but it also was they grew up together. Yeah, well, yeah. 12 years old. I mean, it's, you know, it's a whole different kind of bond. Yeah, uh, it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they like to brag that nobody's ever going to crack that inner circle, and you can't take us down if you can't get somebody in the inner circle. Yeah, nobody. Now, maybe they get, yeah, maybe they get somebody just outside that circle, but yeah, they, they may have a point. Yeah, I, I I actually think they do, you know, because uh, you know not everybody's privy to everything. If there's six of them, I'm just going to say it will. Joe and Gamby, maybe seven of them or whatever, eight of them that are really, really tight. They're not going to be all privy to everything that went on with everything that they did. So I believe the tight guys around them, especially Lance, I really believe uh, they're not going to have that problem. Yeah. I really don't. You know, but then, you know, you never know. You never know. Bobby Garanti murdered for us. Here's a guy did time, did a bad guy, bad guy. And he flipped on me, Bo. He flipped on me. Never thought it would happen, but he flipped on me. And that's why Bobby Gentile was mad at him. I had to tell him, you know. Guy flipped on me. You never know who's going to flip. Guys that I killed with, David, George, they flipped on me up here. Well, well what am I supposed to do? You never know where it's coming from. Never know. And it's sad. For them, for their sakes, I hope they just stay tight together. You know? And they might look at me now because of what I just said. Ah, look at this jerk off talking. You know what he's talking about. But I really believe there's a bond down there that's not going to be broken. And that bond keeps Joey where he is. We'll see, because we know the Fed's been working this 10, 12 years. Those unsolved murders. Oh, and I know. That's, that's I the know. jackpot for them. Yeah. And I, you know, I talked to some guys. I said, "Why, you know, why, I, I can't make a legitimate living. They're never going to let me make a legitimate living. That like anything I do, they're looking at, even when it's legitimate." And I said to the guy, "You know why? Because they think you got away with murder. Yeah, they believe you got away with murder, and that's that, that's what drives them." Yeah, yeah. And this is why these guys came to me when they came. Yeah. I'm not yeah. going to say what organization, whatever. Just happened a few weeks ago. Yeah. You know, when I first came back to Boston, they were knocking at the door. What am I going to do? But you know what? You know where I was today? I went to work. I sell cars again. I went, to, no, really. That's it. I'm doing the show. I'm selling cars. I don't want to know nothing. You know? Bob, are you a nine to five guy again? Is that what you're telling yeah, me? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> and I'm proud George, of that. You told me the other day, you know, I'm working again. I, got, I could talk to you after five o'clock. You know? Yeah, yeah. I got home at five o'clock tonight on the thought to make sure I got ready to do the show. You know, but. You gotta do something in life. We gotta make money. We gotta pay our bills. And I am not going back on the street. Yeah, I'm not gonna do it. Hey Bob, Bob George and I gotta plug our show a little bit too. We got a video coming up pretty soon yeah, on MobTalkSitDown.com. Yeah. And we talked about the Colombo crime family indictment in New York. Yeah. And the implications that maybe that has across the country. Mm -hmm. That some of the crimes in there are 20 years old. The guys in that case, George, 87, right? 83. The boss is 87. 87. 87. Yeah. Yeah. The other boss. yeah. So and what we talked about is is that they never give up and they're never going to go away. And now they buried the whole top, the hierarchy of the Colombo crime family with this God. family. Type. They wiped yeah. that out. Yeah. There's a big labor racketeering case. Yeah. Yeah. And it went on for 20 years. So well, we'll see. We'll see where that goes. We'll see what happens down here. You know. Yeah. We got that one indictment pending, and, and everybody's waiting to see if there's another shoe. I don't. I don't know if there's another another shoe's going to drop. I don't know. Well, you know something. I, I you know I know Lucchese guys still. I'm still friends with Colombo guys. I'm still friends with a lot of people. I don't want to talk too much about things, but um, these families that were you know as well as I do, or more than me, that were once powerful, they're just not powerful anymore. Yeah. They don't have the clout. 
<coughs> listen, you cut the head off. These younger guys that they make it today and these guys running around on the street, they're not like the old timers. They're never going to keep it together. This is why everybody thought Joey and them were going to fill. Because they were young Turks at the time, you know? Yeah. Who else has a bond like they do? These other guys don't. It's all about money, ego, pride, you know? Besides the Genovese and the Gambinos, the big families, all these other little families, they're destined. I'd say not even in the next 20 years, you're not even going to hear them anymore. That's only my opinion. That's my opinion. You know? With all this technology, everything is, forget it. Let's even forget about that, the informants. You can't even have a meeting. My friend Anthony Alwada got made in the Genovese family when I was away. They put him in a room. I think they made four or five guys that night. I know the story first. He's a, one of my best friends, you know. One at a time, they had to strip down and put a bathrobe on. They got made in bathrobes. Yeah. That's how careful the Genovese family is. Why even have the ceremony and bring these guys in if you can't trust them? What is this turning into, George? Yeah, yeah well, that's a good point. I mean, what is it turning into? Yeah, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is you nobody trusts anybody. Yeah. And now today, people up here, they laugh at these May guys. I'm not saying there's not serious guys up here in the Philly, but they say, especially the women I talk to, because they know who I used to be, you know. She said, Bobby, these guys, we laugh at them. They still want to be gangsters. These guys are all crazy. You know, why would you want to be a gangster in this day and age? Why would you want to do that? Knowing you could be ratted on any time, killed, clipped. How long are you going to last on the street, George? How long could this last? You got to be the insane. Line. Yeah. You know, how long can you last? Listen, when I'm in the car lots, when I'm out, people come up, they still hug me and kiss me and respect me. I still have a lot of respect up in the neighborhoods. You know those uh, who's ever left up here from my old crew, which I could care less about, they got nothing good to say about me. Or maybe some of these patriarchs, but who gives a shit about what a dozen or a dozen and a half guys have to say about me? You know? I go out, I still get the respect. It, you know, it makes me feel good. And I like being a good guy now. I don't want no one looking down on me no more. Because I live that lifestyle. I don't want no one to say he's a drug dealer, yeah. he's a this, he's a murderer. I don't want to hear that no more. But to, to bring it full circle, come back to, to women who, who cut through all the bullshit. There was a famous state during the big war down here where when Joey got wounded and, and then Mikey Chen got killed. Yeah. And Joey's sisters picked up on the phone, phone tap, and she says, What are they fighting over? Jail time or coffins? I mean, that's, that's, you know, again, women cut right through the nonsense. This is yeah. what it's about. You're going to end up dead or in jail. Yeah. That's what, that's what she said. Jail time, or, what are they fighting over? Jail time or coffins? It, it, it's not, well, you know, listen, Joey's house, Joey says she's a great girl. So I met her before, the mother of everybody. They grew up, in the, you know, the husband, it's sad. Yeah. The son falls into it. That was my mother's biggest fear. She never wanted me around my father. You're going to end up like him, she kept telling me. You're going to end up like him. And sure enough, it happened. Yeah. My wife told me, I got married at 21, Dave. I was a carpenter. I had a construction company. I was developing. I bought my first building. You know? She said to me, what happened to you? I married a carpenter. How did this happen, this poor girl? You, you understand what I'm saying, George? How does it happen? These women are sharper than us. They are. I know that. I see that again and again and again. I yeah. told you, Bobby... You should have been a saloon singer, man. Yeah. You have... Well, I always yeah. wanted to be an opposite pre <laughs> Elvis Presley impersonator. It just didn't work out. <laughs> and George and, I, George and I have stood in a lot of, lot of hallways in the courthouses listening to the wives and the girlfriends right. after, after the, the verdicts come down. It's painful, yeah. you know, because they know, you know, 14 years, you know, they called it the racketeering light. They called it all kinds of things like that. Yeah. But 14 is still 14, 9 is still 9, 10 is still 10. I mean, that's a big chunk yeah. out of your life. And not to mention the time you spend in jail before the trial. Yeah. You know, the money that costs you to put on a defense. I mean, that, that's not easy on family members. David, you know, um, I, we, I was making a lot of money. We lived a good life. 
right up until I got arrested. My poor wife had to hear 20 years in the courtroom after fighting the government for a few years. 20 years. Yeah. She fell apart in there. This girl didn't deserve that. My kids didn't deserve to lose their father. But I chose that path. I took it. You know, and uh, you know, we gotta tell these kids today, you gotta be insane. You really gotta be insane to do this. I don't care if you're illiterate, I don't care what you are in life, I don't care your background, creed, color. Go work at Walmart. Go to Dunkin' Donuts. Why not, Dave? Look, I'm selling used cars. I wouldn't even sit in half of them. I got wish, but I'm selling them. Yeah. yeah, sure. This is what I gotta do. Listen, yeah. Yeah. there's no George excuse. George knows Johnny likes saying the same thing. He's out there telling kids, don't do this. Yeah. Don't don't go for that life. Yeah. Walk away from that life, right? Yeah. Because as, as George just said, what are you fighting over? Coffins or jail or jail sentences? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, if one way or the other, that's how it ends. Yeah. It's sad. Very rare if somebody just walks away from the whole thing. Yeah. Well, with the grace of Philadelphia, I was able to. And I'll say that, and you know that's truthful. Now, George is laughing, but, you know, uh, I've been home for three years. No one's bothering me. No one's getting in touch with me. They're just leaving me alone. And God bless them guys down there. And that's why I pray for them. You know? Okay. It's sad because, George, I'm not going to lie, I miss them. I miss coming to South Philly. I miss going to Delilah's. <laughs> you know, I miss uh -huh. <laughs> I, I miss it all. I miss those guys. I had great times with them. My friends here in Boston, I miss it. But you want to know something? I just can't live like that no more. I made a decision. That was it. Well, good for you, Bobby. Bobby, it's always a pleasure talking to you. We appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank and you for coming it, on it, tonight. It's never, George, it's never dull with Bob, right? No. <laughs> 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 you know, you know, you were talking about Bobby Gentile's uh, spicy and hot food, right? Yeah. These conversations are always spicy and hot with you, Bob. You know that. I'm glad. I hope you enjoyed it. You know. Absolutely. All right, man. Take care of yourself. We appreciate it. Listen, God appreciate bless. That. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Thanks for having us on. Thank you.